Hi, let's talk about IT transformation in the digital world. Development has evolved over the last 20 to 30 years to match the business need. The pressures of changes in the business have meant that development of IT applications has changed significantly. In the 1990s and previous to that, most all applications were built in a monolithic manner. Large, complicated, integrated applications, sometimes called spaghetti code. The problem was that when you wanted to make changes to keep pace with the business, everybody had to agree on every single demand. There were also unanticipated effects when a change was made, and you had to do exhaustive testing on each and every change, expensive and slow. Most systems haven't progressed beyond that today in the IBM I world. SOA came around to solve some of those problems. Unfortunately, SOA was not really adopted in its implementation model by many, if any, IBM I sites. A lot of companies wrapped their systems, but essentially they weren't implementing a service-oriented architecture on the back end. It did provide more autonomy to individual groups and business units, but just like in the monolithic, you still had to fit in with the overall design and the architecture of the application, which means that you had to coordinate with others, which can be slow and laborious. Modern development is much more granular. Development using APIs, everything is written with an API interface, an application program interface, which has been around a long time, but using an industry standard approach, uh, and the most modern variant of that being REST and its preceding ones, SOAP, REST being the more simpler one using JSON, and microservices, where we compose lots of little, completely decoupled services together to form macro services and expose them as APIs so that we can integrate the different parts of our business, both internal and external. It means that you don't need to coordinate with the entire organization when you want to add a piece of functionality. It's using a standardized microservices architecture and standardized approach to exposing them and developing them. So a lot of structure and organization is included in the code, but there's a very granular level of dynamic freedom that the developers have and therefore the business has focused and automated testing at a very, very small granular level. So it means that testing is not expensive and mostly it can be automated. And it makes continuous delivery possible. If I can develop small, agile pieces of code based upon user requirements and deliver them every two weeks, the business is going to have a continuous delivery of improvement to its application and therefore its business operation. If we look at traditional attempts to modernize IBM I, most of them haven't worked. Um, if not all of them haven't actually worked to any great degree. They're largely still sitting in a monolithic architecture. Some of the attempts include refacing or screen scraping, modular coding using IBM's proprietary uh, integrated language environment um, when it balked at the thought of building an object-oriented version of its procedural language RPG uh, around about 1998. Line-by-line -line conversions have been tried where we take a large spaghetti system and we turn it into a large spaghetti system in a modern language. Uh, the latest craze for want of doing something uh, rather than nothing at all is to modernize the database to SQL uh, and expose it as stored procedures. That came around around about 2000 and in the IBM MySpace that's seen as the latest and greatest. Uh, open access, another way to essentially use legacy approach to programming monolithic but throw the user interface out using a uh, different type of technology. Um, and re-engineering to model view controller. Model view controller was uh, adopted in the mainstream around about the turn of the century and large has been superseded, uh, if not completely superseded by um, service-oriented architecture, um, APIs and microservices. All of these attempts are slow, they're expensive, they don't necessarily provide any immediate business advantage that is sustainable and therefore most businesses don't have much enthusiasm or provide sponsorship to these projects. One of the major problems is that mid-range systems were designed as an all-inclusive platform um, and external integration was added later on. So let's have a look at how modern development works. Modern development is the agile development of microservices with continuous delivery to multiple device types from multiple sources. I'm getting information from everywhere. My customer relation management system, my logistics system, the distribution system, where the hell are my goods? How does it relate to my order? What's happening to the order that I purchased from my supplier? And we want to integrate all these multiple sources of information with different device types. Essentially machines talking to machines, hence the need for standardized integration 
uh, methods, architectures, frameworks and industry standards. So when the time comes for application to application integration, there's no need for a separate integration middleware. They can talk to each other. They're now being developed in a standardised way. We can use whatever language we want, but the way that we expose it is standardised. Therefore, they can talk to each other. And that industry largely being APIs, nowadays RESTful APIs, and JSON being the integration language that's passed backwards and forwards. The fine-grained, stateless, self-contained nature of microservices make, means that decoupling between different parts of a code base and that's what makes it easy to update, replace, remove, remove or augment. If I change a piece of code somewhere, it has no effect anywhere else unless it's used there. But essentially I can change it, test just that component, and it will carry on working. If we look at digital integration for RBMI with the Lexa technology, we're providing technology that makes it a standard approach using existing languages and skills to develop microservices and APIs. So your current workforce can be deployed with all of their skill and knowledge of your business and your application using a language they're very comfortable with, which is very adept at actually getting information out from the database and expose it as a set of APIs and RESTful services or microservices without having to learn all of the technologies, techniques, methods and standards of the open standards industry and modern development. So we can focus on developing, getting the data out. In terms of modernization of an entire system, forward engineering provided with some seeds um, of uh, information from the existing system or the users can provide at a granular level automation in transforming the entire system ultimately to an API based application stack. There is no press the button, put it in the sausage factory and now it comes at the other end. This granular approach to providing automation at a much lower level and at a detailed granular level means that automation services and automation tools can also be recomposed based upon a use case scenario. Traditional web services on the IBMI and other legacy mainframe application uh, stacks um, largely are too granular and complex, right down in the bowels writing CGI code, for example, in Python or, or C, or, or they're rigid and opaque where people have built very, very large complicated middleware products like enterprise service buses. Some of those have been repurposed recently and remarketed as the solution for REST APIs, but essentially you're just putting another layer on and refacing it, which is what it's always happened. They're usually very unproductive and often very costly. Some of the examples are integrated web services server using PCML. It's very, very rigid. CGI, CGI hand coding, as I mentioned a moment ago, can be very, very complicated and you've got to know everything about XML parsing, JSON parsing, handshaking, HTTP header requests, SSL, etc., etc., just to write an application, and you've got to code it that way every single time. Direct Java JT400 wrapping, essentially running your data through the JVM on the IBMI or on the mainframe. It's slow, it's laborious, and it's opaque from a debugging point of view. And the point of breakage is very, very often difficult to actually discern where something has gone wrong. A recent latecomer to the party is Node.js, but essentially this is a similar implementation to the JT400. Wrapping files as services are not program endpoints. It's not industry standard. Just because we're using the popular framework of Node.js, but using an industry standard approach, means that we're going to end up in another proprietary corner. Lexa is flexible and pre-configured by use case. It's very granular. We've developed all the elements at a granular level that can then just be recomposed and reused to do all the complicated interfacing stuff and allow the developer just to develop the extraction methods and programs to get the data out. And we don't have to program every facet every single time. So it has a combination of flexibility but productivity. So what are we doing with Lexa? We're exposing the AS100 as a pure API server. It uses all the latest standards and protocols. So it's easy to employ people and get them up to speed very quickly. It means that legacy people, legacy resources and developers can do development very quickly in a simple way and it obscures the complexity from them. It enables the business to participate in digital disruption. Digital disruption means that we draw vague lines around the business on where we get our information from and how we manage our application and we can do that very, very quickly using an agile approach. So therefore it provides a low risk, high benefit, long term strategy. We can end up modernizing the entire system by forward engineering APIs and microservices 
to ultimately replace the system. The deliberate architecture of Lexa is that the complicated elements, which are available as source code in certain versions of the product, are a small footprint that the developer never needs to have access to. The actual exposed service is a light footprint which has embedded components that do all the complicated work and it then enables the developers to integrate any existing code or legacy skills with this very simple architecture. Lexa was originally developed as a series of components for various clients that needed to achieve digital integration around the globe. Some of these companies include insurance companies, banks, switching companies. About three years ago, a decision was made to collect all of these components together and productize these various elements. So the technology and the framework already has a, a rich set of proven capabilities across the full spectrum. These are being developed all the time to include modern requirements and standards such as uh, things like OAuth for authorization and authentication, SSL, TLS, and various other integration gateways such as Data Power, API Connect, and other API management technologies and methodologies. Lexa is scalable right up to an enterprise level. It has the capability of integrating with all industry standard gateways and methods deployed by various API mechanisms. There's a console, but the core components of the modules themselves reside on the IBM I. If we dig into that in a bit more detail, we embed various of the app of modules that handle things such as JSON parsing, uh, XML parsing, WSDL handling, CSV handling, etc. etc. And we combine them with the source code written by the developers into a single program object which is exposed automatically as a service. Exposes it using swagger definition and then documenting it using the YAML definitions that come with the Swagger UI. This is all done automatically. So it's simple to build an application and then expose it as an API. Of course, it then has the capability to integrate all of the standard components that come with the IBM I, be that the file server, any existing RPG, COBOL, sign-on code, CL, any language that runs on the IBM I, the db 2 for i and of course, MQ. So all of the existing skills and resources and approaches can be adopted just the same. But equally, in the exposed components, we can expose it as SOAP, we can handle CSVs, images, PDFs, we can expose it as REST or JSON, the most modern variant of API used today. If we draw down even further into the application, the modules consist of around about 70 or 80, and these evolve as the requirements change going forward, that do things such as REST handling, all the posts, get, update, delete, and add SOAP handling, per service security, including SSL and TLS, OAuth, tokenization. It's got a built-in tokenization mechanism, so you can expose your APIs as a full committed gateway if you need to. It integrates with the Apache FOP for printing. It does things like CSV, PDF, XLS, Excel spreadsheets, text, XML object handling for creation, parsing and validation, processing into data files, object uploads. It does code page processing, so it will already handle double byte character set and is proven in different countries already. RPG code templates so that the developer can actually select a use case. Uh, for example, doing a SOAP consumer, we put, supply a set of templates. They start at that point, add their code, compile, and off they go. And also Swagger 2.0 API documentation templates for different approaches to documentation, a generation automation tool, and a web catalog editor. Lexo has been deliberately designed to also extend using the same mechanisms but also some integrated purpose-built tightly coupled mechanisms for other tools, methods and frameworks such as API Connect, IBM's Data Power, FOP on Apache, the workflow mechanisms from various vendors such as the one from TDOMS called Gravity, Swagger UI, Swagger Editor, RDI, Loopback, Source Change Management Tools and other DevOps tools such as Rational Team Concert. These are standard extendable features that come with the Lexa engine itself. We also have a complete set of security and gateway patterns for IBM's data power, which can help an enterprise integration implementation of APIs and security 
from about three years down to a couple of weeks. Let's do a worked example of how we've taken an insurance application for the company Hypershaw, a hypothetical insurance company application, and take it from an RPG implementation integrated with various other components out such as systems of engagement such as Twitter and then systems of insight such as Blue Mix, IBM's Blue Mix Watson, which will do some sort of cognitive analysis on the sentiment that a particular user feels about the application. Let's have a quick look at this HyperSure application. It's a typical RPG legacy application with text-based screens, limited capability to put information up on the screen in a simple way. We can drill down through the application. It's got subfiles, all of the typical mechanisms that you would expect in a legacy RPG application. First, let's go and look at the RPG microservice that we created to extract the client information from the database. I used a template that pre-existed for building a REST application. It automatically comes with the binding directories built in and the binding directories are the components that we spoke about earlier on which form the core of the Lexa engine which does all the complicated interfacing, parsing, handshaking, authorization, etc, etc. All of these templates are very well documented and very simple structure. We bring in generic elements that do various handling things such as getting information, setting information and responding to the service request that is part of the API request itself. The copybooks bring in any additional procedure interfaces that come from the core frameworks so if they need to be nominated because we do provide the entire source code for the engine itself. So if uh, a developer or a company needs to tweak any particular approach such as setting uh, particular header fields in the header request for the REST request, this can be done as part of their project and it become a customized version of the engine for their requirement. But at the most common use of the product, we use all of those as standard. We then define the various data variables that we want for the service, the service types that we want, any overrides that apply, some simple features to process the response of the parameters and parse them as they come in and out from the request and the response, various procedures to pass the information between the framework itself and the actual data coming back from the read and then the SQL processing to read the data and that's it and that's the end of the program so an entire service written in 187 lines of code that goes and does a complete restful response to a get request using JSON pass back now let's have a look at the actual API definition itself and look at the JSON as it comes back from the service. This is a catalog of the services that I created when I built the RPG programs and then exposed them and compiled them. Part of the post-compilation process is to run a little routine that automatically builds the Swagger code and then we're using an embedded version of the Swagger user interface, an open source or an open stack technology that documents it. And we can see this is the get client by ID. It has documentation what it's for, um, a bit of information about what the status 200 would provide. In other words, a positive response or successful response. It tells me the definition of what comes back. This is what they call the uh, JSON schema. In other words, the definition of the data that's coming back. And in fact, we can even test it from this user interface. And let's run that for that particular client execute it and it comes back with this information here. We can also look at running that in the browser and see the full return of information that comes back from another one of the services, the client list. So now I've got information that's coming back from the server in an industry standard format, in this instance, structured JSON. If we then take this a step further forward and say, let's go and look at the application that we built. And we'll go and have a look at the source code um, in both HTML and JavaScript of this application at the moment. But simultaneously to building the back end, I integrated this new client 
uh, or JavaScript HTML5 CSS3 application that I built over that JSON and I integrated some services coming from Twitter in this instant. I want to find out this particular client, what tweets they might be making about the company HypoShore. And when I look through those tweets, I want to then go and get some insight from the Watson analysis to find out if this particular user is both positive or negative about the HypoShell company. So we're integrating a back-end service with a system of engagement in the form of Twitter and then integrating it simultaneously or subsequently with the Watson sentiment analysis, another service that runs on the IBM cloud uh, framework called Bluemix and we're putting that in a single application. So we're putting the HyperSure application in a modern context, but also using it in a very modern digital based way. And the only bit of code that I did to build this was the backend service component and the user interface component, which we'll have a look at now. Let's now look at the code that was used to produce this user interface. I'm looking at GitHub where we've stored our repository of all the components that we use to generate and build this user interface. I'm going to drill right down into the component that we're interested in in this instance because the majority of this code was standard code which is part of the framework that we imported into this particular project. It's one of the huge benefits of using open source frameworks and standards in a very very modern way. It means significant amounts of your application code is developed by other people and you just use it. Let's drill down into the claim list, the client list in this instance, and we're going to have a look at the code that was used. Now this is a React project. React is a technology, uh, which is an, again, it's an open source standard free uh, framework, which allows you to develop user interfaces using industry standard languages like HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, and enables you to very quickly and rapidly build the user interface and run it anywhere. There's even a native version, so you can build a user interface and run it in the web, on an Android phone, on an iPad tablet, or on an iPhone. Let's go and have a look at the client list itself. So again, much of this is just plumbing, bringing in the information and reusing components that exist in the standard framework. And then the main component for building the user interface, which essentially is just after the JSON that has come back from the server request and the program that we looked at a moment ago in RPG, and then we return this component. Again, we're using another industry standard, uh, Bootstrap, which is a, a framework of CSS components that was uh, donated to the open source community by Twitter. It enables you to make very clean, nice looking user interfaces in a very, very structured and organized fashion and a very consistent look and feel. So we're using just a, a class name called uh, column large four. In other words, we want to uh, put that particular element on this grid and four components means that it will be one third of the screen in this instance. We're then putting the information that comes back and we're in the curly brackets here. We can see information that's coming from one of the JavaScript classes, which is in this instance setting the style of the box that we're using and setting, for example, the class name. In other words, I want this particular panel to look like a panel with the header. And if we go back to look at the client inquiry, that's that header that we can see here. That's the style that it's bringing back. Then if we go back into there, we can then see that we're bringing up and listing all of the information that comes back from the service request. This client.client .client essentially is mapping the JSON object and looking at the client because the JSON object, if you remember, when we looked at the actual client list, is has a key of client. And then it's got an object underneath that that lists the details of that particular client. So then we use a dot to specify that we want the field client and we want to put it in that particular field. And as we navigate down here, we can see we're bringing in information from various fields on that JSON request and we're throwing it up on the screen. And that's it. That's the component that we use, as simple as that, to actually build the user interface. So we've got the backend component simply written in RPG, which essentially is a container for writing SQL code to be returned back to as a response in JSON format to this particular user interface. I built a Node.js application using React so that I can then embed HTML, bootstrap classes, and very, very quickly build a very clean, neat user interface and then integrate it with 
Again, open source Twitter tweet functions, and these were developed by downloading Twitter open source functions, which enabled me to call the Twitter function, passing the parameter of this particular Twitter handle for this particular user, and integrate the response, again coming back in JSON, into my tweet count in this list that we can see at the bottom and then the sentiment analysis was using this particular user and the information that they tweeted about the company in this instance that comment and then go and call the twitter uh, sentiment analysis on the ibm blue mix server and all of this development took place in a day and a half from scratch and the two developers that did it because we wanted to show that the development could be done independently was that the back-end service was written by an RPG programmer who'd never seen Lexa before. And with about two hours of training and having a look at the template, they were able to produce JSON that was sent as a response. The front-end developer didn't speak to the back-end developer once. They just looked at the Swagger UI definition of what was available, and they built the user interface by interrogating and discussing it with the user themselves. And we came back and we had this application built. Just to close off, I just want to share a little bit about the experience that we've had and the key factors that drive digital business change within various companies. The first most important point, it must be business driven. Rather than doing lengthy technology junkets that produce some obscure and vague business benefit at the end of it, if any, we need it to be driven by the business. The business expects change quickly. They want to be dynamic. So therefore, APIs and microservices allow them to achieve that. It means that you, with the agile development methodology and continuous delivery, we mean the business can own the results much more quickly, which means they'll continue to invest it, which means it's much easier to measure the value of this investment, which means that the entire organization works more harmoniously and with significant amount of development being done using open source frameworks, the costs will be dramatically reduced. Standardization is another key cornerstone. What makes this all possible is the fact that people are now using industry standard mechanisms to both define, expose, read and consume the services between systems. Proprietary, sockets driven systems have been around for 30 plus years. What made all the difference to companies is the fact that they use standardization. A simple example is Netflix saved a billion dollars in a single year once they got up to speed by exposing their systems as APIs. It means that they didn't have to evolve their business. Other developers developed applications that use the information and the movies that came out of Netflix. It's not to say that every company is going to make a billion dollars, but that you are going to save significant amounts of money if you use open source systems and allow other developers to develop part of your digital enterprise experience, which will improve your customer experience. Any machine or human can use the same service. In other words, the interaction between developers can be significantly decoupled, which means that the asynchronous method of user interface development and back-end server stable development can take place at its most effective manner. And you'll reduce your biggest cost. You'll have more productivity and you'll have access to a bigger and therefore cheaper labor pool because you're using standard approaches to development. Security usually the last thing people look, but it must be the first thing that every organization looks at. By implementing things in a standardized way and implementing API-driven systems in a structured way, it means that you'll actually improve on your security. So systems of record will have a much better secure exposure and even applications at the back end will actually have, be, have a better security layer because everything will be done in a standard as well, standardized way. And because you're having granular components and that they're all driven in a standardized way, to measure and audit the security on these systems is much, much easier than trying to do it on monolithic proprietary systems. And that the security is layered and predictive, not just reactive. So you can put mechanisms in place to actually predict the outcome and measure it. Because the reality is, as you lose control of the end-to-end -end environment, you can't demand that everyone else is going to follow your proprietary enterprise standard. You have to get with the program and develop it in an industry standard way. What we provide to help people get up and running is a combination of education and training, services to get things started by providing technical expertise at the beginning or throughout the life cycle of a project, and the technology itself. So we can give 
training at the highest level on the concepts of both management and development deployment and implementation of the various technologies that make digital business work. We can provide services for both strategic planning and consulting, the actual development itself, and even the implementation of other technologies such as IBM Data Power if you want to scale gateways across distributed environments around the planet. And we provide the technology, both from our own technology in the form of the Lexa API server for RPG on IBM I, the one that we've been looking at today, and other IBM software that may be required, the DevOps technologies, API Connect, Rational Developer for I, Apache, Data Power, and various other technologies that may be part of the DevOps and the life cycle of development and implementation of APIs in a digital world. Thanks.